Thank you, Jack. It's a wonderful opportunity to scare the heck out of uh, some CPAs <laughs> and board execs uh, as well. Um, I, of course, I was asked to identify three top cases of the year uh, and, and update you about them. Uh, I've actually uh, demonstrated why I am an attorney and not a CPA. I identified four. <laughs> Notwithstanding what the topic says, uh, the, all four are in the materials that, uh, that you were given. Uh, mainly these cases do not directly involve, uh, or at least a, a state board was not a party to them, and usually I focus on that, but I've, I've, I've done more of that at the, the legal update and occasionally at the, at the annual, I'll, I'll focus more on that. But th these were interesting, uh, if not fun, for different reasons. Uh, the uh, first one I'll just go over uh, briefly is the Greenberg versus Western CPE. Uh, I'd note that it's an unpublished decision, meaning the court rendered a decision, but it was not published in the reporters, the usual ways, and their limitations on how it can be cited. But the operating facts behind the decision are uh, at least a heads up or a lesson to all of us, because what happened was you had a CPA who uh, was uh, convicted, uh, originally charged, convicted uh, uh, with regard to a crime. Uh, is, uh, he was also licensed uh, in California. California sought to uh, take a disciplinary action against his license based upon the conviction. Uh, he didn't show up at the hearing and uh, therefore they entered the discipline of revocation by default. As it turned out later, the, basically the underlying criminal conviction was uh, overturned and he then turned around and sued uh, the, a CPE provider who had included a summary of his disciplinary case in, his CPE, in, in their CPE materials. So you have, uh, and, and the summary, by the way, was verbatim taken from the California Board newsletter, I believe, uh, or, or otherwise available online. So you had uh, an accurate repeat of a description of a disciplinary action used for teaching purposes and that forming a basis for allegations of uh, slander uh, and so forth. The court looking at the case ultimately uh, uh, found against the plaintiff in that instance, uh, even though the summary of the disciplinary action, the underlying uh, facts had changed, the summary itself was verbatim and was correct, was an accurate description of what had happened with California Board at one point. And of course it was a state board action. There was some immunity with regard to that. And so the CPE provider was not held uh, liable in this instance. Uh, as an aside, also unreported, there was, uh, and in fact, there no formal decision, but there was originally also a suit filed by the same individual against the state board, but that was dismissed, uh, and I have no other uh, details, no details are public on that. Uh, suffice it to say, it presents an interesting challenge in a day where we want to be sure that we are including as much accurate, correct information with regard to licensees as possible uh, on things such as our ALD and, and so forth, uh, especially in a very mobile world. The second case that, um, in Ray Garcia, that had been the subject of, I think, uh, of some previous uh, reports I'd given. Uh, it's an interesting one. There had been a bit of a buzz around it. Uh, it does not involve a CPA. It involves uh, someone who is seeking to be licensed as an attorney. In this instance, Garcia was an undocumented immigrant who did not have lawful status in the U.S. and was seeking admission to the California State Bar. State Bar Committee actually supported his application and requested the Supreme Court rule that uh, he could be licensed as an attorney in California. 
there is a federal law, Federal Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation, uh, Reconciliation Act that prohibits uh, states from licensing undocumented uh, immigrants unless there's a specific law uh, allowing it in, in their state. Uh, the, in this case, the, actually the U.S. Department of Justice came in, uh, intervened, and opposed the licensing of Garcia. Uh, ultimately, the court decided uh, in favor of Garcia, allowed the uh, licensing of Garcia in this instance, uh, but also uh, along the way, uh, California did clarify its situation by adopting a specific law that was effective January 1, 2014, that specifically would allow attorneys to be licensed. Uh, there are also similar cases. Uh, I believe the one in Florida has been resolved in favor of the applicant, uh, one pending in New York. There's also some legislation pending in various spots in the country. Typically, they've been uh, find point aimed at attorneys uh, rather than other professions, but it's equally possible because the Federal Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act applies to any licensed profession. So it's one to watch because it is uh, one where uh, one might, for example, question good moral character if someone's here in violation of law, uh, but the court in that instance in California said that that was not going to be enough, that that was not a bar to uh, Garcia's admission, and, and again, Florida reached the same result. We, we just need to watch for how, if, if it turns around uh, and affects accountancy itself. The next case I wanted to mention is the Lawson versus uh, FMR LLC. This one's interesting. It is, it is the one Supreme Court case uh, in the batch. And here at the Supreme Court, uh, the Sarbanes-Oxley, the whistleblower protection, uh, is, applies, uh, does not typically apply to uh, the accountants for a uh, SEC registrant. Uh, however, in this instance, these were two employees of private subcontractors uh, who blew the whistle with regard to a particular SEC regist uh, registrant and rescinded to the Supreme Court was the issue of whether or not that whistleblower protection would extend to those terminated employer, employees of the private subcontractors. And here specifically, what the uh, court alluded to was uh, that Congress did not intend to leave these professionals vulnerable to discharge or other retaliatory action uh, for complying with the law. The implication is that in part, uh, because uh, an outside CPA firm is a, uh, an independent contractor that someone terminated on that accounting firm then could have uh, protection under Sarbanes-Oxley. I think you can anticipate that there will be a rise over time of, uh, of complaints to boards. We've seen a few already of whistleblower situations uh, where uh, they'll be coming in. And this brings together the stress that exists between the whistleblowing and the obligation with regard to confidentiality, an issue which uh, the Uniform Accountancy Act Committee is, uh, is looking, uh, especially in not only the statute, but the, the model rules to see if we can achieve a, a more universal fix. Its uh, situation has been dealt with quite differently in Europe and in a handful of states that have dealt with it directly, something to be seen. So again, it's one which has opened a door that probably did not exist before uh, because the firms themselves could not, the accounting firms could not qualify as whistleblowers, uh, but employees who were terminated by those accounting firms might have that protection as, as whistleblowers. Uh, could potentially and this was a concern that was expressed by uh, the losing parties in this case uh, and by the uh, minority of the court because it was a split decision. Uh, it, it could uh, open the door, literally floodgates, with regard to uh, potential litigation, but also complaints, professional complaints, with regard to uh, the 
auditing of uh, SEC registrants and the conduct of private independent contractors. The bonus case is one that uh, 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 Mike just referred to. It, uh, it was uh, a Connecticut court case. And in that particular case, there is a statute that prohibited, well, there, there was a, uh, a grant. Uh, you had a, a precious metals dealer's license. And the persons that granted that license in Connecticut are essentially the police chiefs uh, of, of municipalities. And the statute creating the licensing of that uh, profession of uh, precious metal dealers said that absolutely no one who has been convicted of any felony shall be licensed as a precious metals dealer. No discretion, absolute, a bar and a ban. Uh, as, as it were. The court looked at that, and, and I, I, we have to say in context, uh, uh, by contrast, the Uniform Accountancy Act and the, most states' accountancy laws provide that uh, conviction of a felony may be grounds for uh, denial of a license or grounds for discipline, uh, but it's not automatic. They're, they're, you still have to look at it, exercise discretion. Uh, in determining it. That's the way the statute reads. I, I suspect in practice most boards would look at a felony, uh, especially if it's a felony involving uh, financial crime, and be fairly automatic about it. But the key there is they're looking, they're still looking at the crime, and they're not just saying, ah, felony, you're out. There has, there has to be more and, and a more careful regard for it. So again, uh, by and large, it's not automatic under the UAA, most states' county laws. There is one state that has a bar with regard to non-licensee owners that they shall not have been convicted of any felony. So that might be an interesting side angle test on it. It's not the individual license because they're not individually licensed, but the firm might be at peril uh, because of the the conviction of a felony by one non-licensee uh, owner. Uh, the way the UAA is worded, it again turns to moral character and conviction of a felony would be, of course, a consideration in determining moral character. The uh, court looked at it, weighed it all in, uh, as, as was stated earlier, said, no, sorry, you cannot have an absolute ban on licensure based solely upon conviction of any felony. There has to be more. But the court was clear and, and said, to be clear, this ruling does not grant Barletta, the applicant, uh, a precious metals license. Should Barletta reapply for a precious metals license, the chief of police may consider the existence and circumstances of Barletta's felony conviction, among other factors, when determining whether or not he should be granted a license. So he was saying, you can still look at it, but you, you've got to exercise your discretion. You've got to look at it and see if it has anything to do uh, with the granting of the license. Once you've done that, then it's probably going to be okay to deny if you uh, have grounds for denial. It was just the blanket denial uh, that was the problem. There have been other occasions where there have been uh, some collateral challenges to this type of, uh, you know, the blanket denial. But again, I think the UAA has, has given you pretty good wording and protection. Uh, and as long as you just look at it and determine that that felony is justification for denial or, or whatever other discipline that, that you want to impose, you should be all right in that. And again, the language in the UAA is also, is also okay with regard to the non-licensee ownership issue as well. So I wanted to, these are the uh, three, <clears throat> four cases that I wanted to highlight. Uh, if I had to watch it all in terms of what's gonna, in the long run, perhaps the most impact on state boards, it, it might very well be the uh, Lawson case, uh, simply because of the, 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 the friction that already exists between whistleblowing and uh, uh, confidentiality. 
and then the responsibilities and protections, uh, whistleblowing protections that are afforded by Sarbanes-Oxley as well. And we may have to look at our Models Act and rules to accommodate this, this new spin to make sure that, uh, that we are anticipating that correctly because, again, confidentiality uh, in itself is supposed to be pretty clear and uh, longstanding protection, and yet at the same time, you have individuals who may, pursuant to a federal statute, uh, in effect, breach that confidentiality. Now, that would be the one that would have the greatest implications. Uh, I think that in Ray Garcia, you just have to watch and see, is this one going to, are these acts in the various states to specifically authorize licensing of uh, undocumented immigrants? Are they going to apply them to all professions uh, or, or narrowly? Well, I have to watch too because there are nuances of it that could have implications with regard to uh, substantial equivalence, multi-state practice, and mobility as well uh, because they may be uh, indeed practicing in states that do not have that same exemption, uh, statutory express exemption available. So not been tested yet, an open question. As for the Greenberg, that's the one that you, you, you need to be scared about a little bit because again, it is possible that someone that you move hastily, quickly to protect the public with regard to uh, a crime a conviction, uh, especially one involving, uh, as this one did, uh, involving uh, financial crimes. And then ultimately, it's something has turned around and you're caught out there with a lot of stuff out there in the public domain, in the public, in public records, accessible instantly by uh, uh, internet and otherwise, and of course, repeated in lots of CPE materials. So, enough to scare you, enough to make you worry, enough to inspire you, and enough food for thought going forward. I, I've got a couple of extra minutes if there are any questions. Steve. I'm Noel Steve Richards from Alabama, and this may not be a fair question, but a couple of years ago, you mentioned a case, and I don't remember the name of it, but uh, I think it was in North Carolina, and it dealt with a dental board, and the jurisdiction of the dental board being able to uh, police, if you will, people that provide teeth whitening services. And there was a ruling, and maybe even an appeals ruling, where uh, it was determined that the dental board, which was made up solely of dentists, didn't have the ability to regulate uh, this activity. What's the status of that, and does that have any continuing impact uh, to, to us? First, uh, Steve, you'll confirm that I in no way suggested that you ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> there are those that have heard about this case a couple of times, too many perhaps, but uh, 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 good question. Uh, the, the period of time for amicus briefs uh, uh, has just about passed. A number have been filed. Uh, NASBA, as a matter of fact, was uh, a supporter of one of the amicus briefs, the uh, Federa FARB, the Federation of uh, Regulating Boards, and a number of others uh, have, have stepped in supporting the state Board of Dentistry in North Carolina. The, the quick thumbnail of, of that case is that this board was attempting to enforce its unauthorized practice statute. Uh, it had received complaints and it even had television reporters on its front doorstep uh, with instances of alleged public harm where people had their teeth whitened at kiosks in malls. The board <coughs> investigated, determined that uh, they were often there was not running water, there were not the usual sanitation means, there was no one there who was, uh, there, there were, at times there was no one there that had been trained, certainly no one that had any uh, professional license of any sort, and there had been instances of alleged public harm. That is one instance where someone had gone on a cruise after getting their teeth whitened 
and in the middle of the cruise, their gums were, well, anyway, <laughs> it was pretty bad. Uh, and they let them off in Mexico to get the urgent dental care, as it were. Um, the Federal Trade Commission uh, came into that one and challenged the board's ability to enforce its Unauthorized Practice Act, and in particular, uh, challenged its ability to do so through cease and desist letters, cease and desist uh, orders or letters, as it were. Those letters almost invariably did not mention teeth whitening in particular, but just said, we have some evidence that you may be engaged in unauthorized practice. Please cooperate with our investigation and gave them a copy of the applicable statute. Federal Trade Commission said that that was unlawfully restraining trade, uh, said that the board did not necessarily have the authority to be issuing those uh, cease and desist letters. Pause a moment. You know that a lot of your boards do uh, a lot of their enforcement with regard to unauthorized practice using cease and desist letters. So you just need to be careful about that. But the key factor in this case, the FTC versus North Carolina State Board of Dental Examiners, uh, was that the board members itself, uh, themselves, were not appointed by the governor, uh, but were elected by a, a vote that was administered pursuant to statute uh, among an election among all of the uh, licensed dentists of the state. And so the, uh, the FTC, uh, although it did not make that part of its case early on, that became the core of its case at the end of the day. Uh, and that's the very issue that has uh, been granted uh, cert to the U.S. Supreme Court. As I say, brief principal brief in for uh, uh, one side already, plus amicus briefs coming in, and there'll be another, well, there'll be a responsive brief, and then it's set for oral argument in October of this year. So we'll, we'll see more on that. The concern that was raised by some, including the, the, uh, the uh, association of states or governors, uh, uh, this was really, of all the states, their concern was that this was an encroachment on the state's prerogative, which had been assured time and again by various cases, the state's prerogative to regulate the professions and to determine for itself when someone should be licensed and what would constitute a danger to the public. The FTC in its decision had said, amongst other things, that basically public protection was not the issue, and that admittedly uh, there were public protection reasons that you could show for, for this restriction, but that it was a restraint of trade, unlawful restraint of trade. Implications for a lot of boards, especially in the area of uh, enforcement with regard to unauthorized practice, uh, if there are any boards whose membership is, is elected by licensees. That's the flag number one you want to watch for. The FTC has taken a broader view of it and said that, you know, this is opening the door to clearly there should not be an automatic state action exemption immunity for licensing boards, uh, even though they're acting pursuant to state law. In the dental board case, one of, the, one of the key things was there was a clear statute that said, not a rule, not a board policy, but a statute that prohibited uh, anyone other than dentists from removing stains from teeth. And so they were operating pursuant to a, a clearly articulated statute. So we'll see more and uh, 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 certainly report on it in the fall, especially you know, if it has significant impact on state boards. Other questions? Louise? This came up at uh, one of the breakout sessions, and it has nothing to do with this, but I think you were one of the guys who was talking about the UIA earlier. Um, the question was, um, how does somebody prove that a non-licensee owner is of good moral character? This is one of the new things, and people are talking about how do they bring non-licensee ownership into their state? Uh, good question. Uh, during the discussion when we added that to the UAA, the requirement that the non-licensee owner uh, have good moral character, uh, part of the point that was made was that there is already not only in the statute, 
an explanation of what good moral character is. But there are, there are, in the model rules, there's a description of what good moral character is. And that uh, to develop a, a good model rule for what is moral character that might be unique to a non-licensee owner as well. And there's actually some court precedents uh, explaining it. And, and there's also court precedent saying that you can't, you can't define it, you can't explain it, but you know it when it's there or when it's not there as well. I, I think a key will be to uh, carefully articulate it in the rules because this is catchy. Uh, you are applying your standards of conduct, your expectations to non-licensees who happen to be owners. Now under the UAA, the uh, non-licensee owners are supposed to be active in the firm, so there's a little bit more to it. It's not just someone in the shadows in the background necessarily. But again, that's under the UAA way of looking at it. So there's a right good definition in the model rules and uh, a structure for one in the statute itself. Other questions? All right, well, I thank you for your attention and uh, forgive me again for uh, not, not yet learning how to count. <laughs>